This morning, by the help of the Holy Spirit, I'll be speaking to us uh, on what I've titled the beloved Christian. The Christian that is relevant to God. The Christian that God will look out for at any point in any time. Interestingly, when I came into the church this morning and, you know, flipped through the, the leaflets in your hand, for those of you that have it on page three, uh, there's, a, there's a, it's a, a writing there. Um, it said, ignorance is dangerous, but knowledge without responsibility is more dangerous. Amen. Amen. And so when I saw it, I said, well, okay, the Spirit of God is one, because I, I, I didn't see that at all. I didn't. He said, knowledge is, ignorance is dangerous, but knowledge without responsibility is much more dangerous, and even more dangerous for the Christian. When Jesus was here on earth, uh, thousands, if not uh, more than thousands uh, years ago, he had so many people that followed him. Many people um, followed him for various reasons. When you look at the scripture, you will see there was first the, the, the group of the multitude. You know, it's happening there, they just follow him. Whatever is going on, they don't even know who the person is. The Bible said because they have heard of his account, he feeds the 5,000, that was a big multitude. At some point, it will go over to the seaside, and before you know it, the Bible said everybody will come. They will bring the sick, the lame, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, and it will heal them all. And once they get their healing, they go. That was the group of the multitude. They had no connection with Jesus, but they followed him because of the things they could get from him. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, because out of those multitudes, there was another group of people. And with all those multitudes, everybody following Jesus, seeing the miracle, what he could do, the demonstration of his power, and the Bible says the next thing that happens is that we just have this group of 70. Out of the multitude, only 70 were the people that Jesus called in Luke chapter 10. Um, sorry, Luke chapter uh, 10. Yeah, Luke chapter 10 from verse 1. The Bible says out of those multitude, God called 70 people. So the question is, what happened to the, the others? 70 out of a multitude, most likely, maybe 10%, maybe less than that. And then they had a group of 70 people. The Bible says he called them. He anointed them with power. He empowered them that he should go forth and preach the gospel. Now, when we talk about anointing with power, many of us will quickly go to the level where you lay your hand on the sick and all those stuff. But the Bible says in the whole Testament and so many places in the scripture, it says it's God that gives you power to get wealth. All right? So power to prosper in your place of work is an anointing. Power to stay ahead is an anointing. Power to have a blissful marital life is an anointing. So it's not only really limited to the anointing that the pastors, in quotes, carry. And so we have these 70 people anointed by God. Why? Because they moved away from being the multitude to become a follower of Jesus, taking responsibility for the things they believed. In 1 John chapter 1, when you begin to read, uh, John the Beloved said, of the things that we have seen, of the things that we have heard, of the things that we have handled, so in other words, we have interacted with Jesus. We cannot but tell you these things. When the word of God does not push you to take action, that word of God most likely is useless. When the word of God does not push you to take responsibility, then indeed you have not believed that word. Because what we believe determines the steps and the actions that we take. The Bible says, as many that believe in him, to them he gave the power to become. It is what you believe that determines what you become. Now, that was the 70. Maybe at some point, they went around, and then they preached and everything. But out of that 70, at the end of the day, the people who Jesus referred to as his disciples were just 12. Out of the 70, it was 12 people. Those were the 12 people who were with him when he was low, who were with him when he was high. Those are the people who were with him when the going was rough, where there was no money to pay tax, where there was no money to go. Those were the people that stuck with him, the 12 people. And so in John chapter 6, the passage that we read in the lesson, when Jesus preached that wonderful message, if you don't eat my body and you don't drink my blood, you're not part of me. Ah, what type of message is this? And the Bible says that was the separation between the multitude, the group of 70, and the group of 12. And the Bible says many began to go back and say, we're not going to follow this man anymore. We thought we are looking for manna. <laughs> we are looking for prosperity. We are looking for divine health. We are looking for promotion. Not this hard saying of don't do this. Don't do that. Bring your tithe. Do all this stuff. No, no, we can't take that. And the Bible says many. That's what the word the scripture uses. Say many began to go back. And they were going. I'm sure the multitude began to reduce and reduce and reduce. 
And then he looked around. The disciples there said, are you also going to go away? Are you also going to go away? And then Peter answered and said, to whom shall we go? We've seen all of them. He said, we can't go anywhere because we know you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I was a committed Christian. He has seen all. He said, you are the Christ. So we're going to follow you no matter how hard it gets. And that is the level I want us to get to this morning. And the Spirit of God will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now you may say, well, okay, we have the 12. But beyond inside the 12, we have three. There's a group of three. The Peter, the James, and the John. That, so you have multitude. You had uh, the 70. You had the 12. But yet there is a group of three. When the chiefs are down, those are the three people that Jesus will carry. And say, come, let's go together. Those are the people that could speak for him. Those are the people that said, look, we know, we know this man that we follow. Apostle Paul said, I know whom I believe. I don't know about you, but I know whom I believe. That was Peter, James, and John. In Matthew 17, when Jesus was going to make himself, reveal himself, to, you know, Jesus came as a baby in the manger. So many people like, is this the Christ? Maybe not, maybe, maybe, or whatever it is. But in Matthew 17, the Bible said Jesus took these three people. James, Peter and John took them to a high mountain and revealed himself to them. When they saw him, they said, ah, indeed. <laughs> they didn't want to come down from the mountain because it's a revelation of the glory of God. That was a group of three. Those were the people who have walked closely enough to him that he could reveal himself to him. In the book of Sunday, the Bible says, the children of Israel seized the, the works of God, seized the miracle of God, partake of his blessing. But the Bible says, only to Moses did God reveal his ways. Everybody can breathe in air. Everybody can see the sun shining, the rain falling. But there are some people that moves that determine how those things come into be. Those are the group of three. So those group of three are the people, the, the people you call the inner cycle men. The people who have said they've burned the bridges behind them. It's too late to go back. We're not going back anymore. I will live for Jesus day after day. We're going to go after him. We'll do everything to follow him. That was the, 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 the people that always go get to the mountaintop in their walk with Christ. So the question to you this morning is, where are you? The multitude, the 70, the 12, and the 3. I tell somebody, I said, if I've been practicing all that I've been hearing since I gave my life to Christ, Maybe I've done 10%. Maybe I've done less than that. But what is important is that every word that you hear, every word that you believe, don't just believe it theoretically in terms of head knowledge, but let it sink to your heart and take an action. It is when you do the word of God that you will see the power in his word. He said, he said, bring you all the title to my storehouse. Many of us have heard that message over and over again. But how many have actually released their time? Not because the church needs money. You know, time will not permit us to say some things. But he said, prove me now I see. So I come, I drop my time. And that's, that's done. I've done my part. And let him do his part. And the song we sang, he said, God is a faithful God. He has never failed. My case will not be an exception in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Let's take responsibility. Let's take responsibility. He said, if any of you is sick, call for the elders in the church. How many of us have tried it? That's the word of God. If you are sick, call the pastor. And the pastor prays for you and say, God, I've got the prayer, so heal me. You know, the Bible says, don't be drawn away from the simplicity of the gospel. It's that simple. That is it. This kind cannot go for by prayer and fasting. You've heard it over and over again. How many of us as Christians have our particular day? Say, this particular day of the week, I stand in the presence of the Lord in prayer and in fasting. If you don't do it, then you don't get the kind that comes out by prayer and fasting. You will just get the one that comes out by 15 minutes of prayer every Sunday morning. You need to take responsibility for the things you believe. As many as believe in him, to them he gave the power. Today we, we tell people, we said, ah, that, that brother is a Christian. The other one is a born again Christian. What's the meaning of that? Praise the Lord. 
But we know what we are saying, you understand? But if you do a little bit of theology on that, there's nothing like that in the real sense of it. Because before you can be called a Christian, you ought to be born again. So when you say a born again Christian, then you're saying there are levels. Eh? <laughs> Amen. Amen. So are you a born again Christian or are you a Christian? The group of the 70, the group of the 12, and then the group of the 3. What is the distinguishing thing about this group of people? It's all about commitment. There is nothing wrong if anything brings you to Christ. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Oh, I, have, I am sick. I am depressed. Everything has been taken away from me. I run to Jesus. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when you get to that level where he has ministered to you, where it has met your need, there is nothing you can use to thank God other than to give him your all. That's the only thing you could use. So it's commitment that distinguishes the, the multitude from the 70, from the 12, from the 3. It's all about commitment. It's all about commitment. How committed are you to the things you've heard? How committed are you to the things you know? How committed are you to the things you believe? I was, I was um, uh, talking with somebody yesterday. I said, many of us do this as Christians. We have a very busy schedule. The first thing that goes away are the things that has to do with God. How many of you can relate to what I'm talking about? Amen. Amen. I have a very busy schedule. I woke up late in the morning. The first thing I cancel is that I can't pray that day. I can't read my Bible in the morning, so I leave it later. But I can still get into the bath, clean myself up. You know, for the ladies, we still put the right things in the right place. You know, for the men, it still takes some time to check which of the ties fit very well. But the same person had no five minutes to just say, Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for all that you've done. It's all about commitment. So that's the first thing that goes. And then you get to work, the work schedule is so loaded. Oh, you have to stay extra late and all those stuff. And then you look at the time. Well, it's quite late. I can't make it to church again today. But on your way going, you probably stop in a friend's house, spend an hour, and then before you eventually get home. It's all about commitment. How committed are you to the things you believe, the things you know, and the things you have heard? Because commitment is what shows, it tells a lot about us. Just three things that I want to bring out this morning. Commitment shows the level and the depth of your relationship with God. That's it. I read of, um, I've forgotten his name now, one of these... Um, great man of God in the early generation. And he told himself, he said, every time I must eat, if I must go to eat, I must read the Bible. A verse, two verses, one chapter, that was his personal discipline. Why? Because he realized he's a spiritual being as well as a physical being. The Bible says, he that sows to the flesh shall reap corruption. But whether I sow to the spirit shall reap life. So anytime I feed this body, I must feed my spirit. Because you understand, the Bible says, I wish above all things that that may yet prosper and be in it, even as your soul prospers. The extent to which you feed your spirit, the extent to which you grow a relationship with Christ, that is the extent to which is going to lift you up, is going to bless you, and is going to reveal his power in your life. The Bible says in a greater there are many verses. Verses unto honor, verses unto dishonor. Some are made of gold, some are made of bronze. Some are made of wood. Some are made of plastic. Some are made of straw. They are all in the house. But you know, vessels of honor get extra attention. Vessels of honor are properly kept, properly secured. So are you a vessel unto honor? How relevant are you to God? Beyond give me, give me, bless me, myself, and I. You need to go a little bit beyond that level. When you are relevant to God and his kingdom, you become an object of his attention. And when you become an object of God's attention, nothing happens to you without his knowing, without his approval. Why? Because you are relevant in the kingdom. How relevant are you to the kingdom? Commitment shows where our passion lies and ends where we push our resources. That's the truth. You see, in a year, some people cannot but go shopping for clothes and shoes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing wrong with that. But 
challenge to us is how many of us have actually spent money on the things that will improve our relationship with God? Ask yourself that question. Think back a little. Don't go too far back. Amen. Amen. <laughs> how many of us have spent money on what will improve my relationship with God? That's the truth. Because you believe him. You've given your life to him. But are you doing anything beyond what the multitude does? What does the multitude do? They come to church on Sundays. Everybody does that. How many? I've gone a little bit further to say, I am buying this book because I want to understand this God I'm serving. I'm going for this other program because, oh, if I go for this program, I'll be able to answer this question, know this thing, do that stuff. I am subscribing to this newsletter or whatever. Thank God for the internet. There's so many things you could do. But your commitment shows it all. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Do you treasure God and his word and his house? Is your heart there? Commitment determines our place in eternity. Commitment determines our place in the kingdom. Today, we have the members, you have the leaders. What's the difference? Oh, yeah, they are pastors, they are anointed, they are called, they are not those things. <laughs> Amen. Thank God for this type of church. All the pastors are working, they are busy, they are just every, just a normal, everyday person like you and I. The difference is all about commitment. That's the difference. Oh, they are called, they are anointed. They are called, they are anointed, not because they are pastors, but because they are committed to God. And so God moved them from being an ordinary member to becoming a leader of his people. It's okay, I don't want to be a pastor. No, you're missing it. The Bible says in Revelation 22, it said, Behold, and come quickly. And my reward is with me. I'm going to give to every man according to his work. Now, when we talk about this, ah, well, it's heaven and health in, you know, I, we don't even know whether it is true or not. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if you have made up your mind to believe him, then indeed you need to do those things that brings his presence into your life. John chapter 15, he said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, I'm going to cut it away. But every branch in me that bears fruit, he said, I will purge it, that it, will, that it may bring forth more. When we talk about purging, a lot of us look at it as discipline, being chastised, being rebuked. Far from that. That may be part of it. But when he said, I will purge you, means he's going to listen to every of your requests. He's going to provide to every of your need. Because he knows that you are going to use whatever he gives to you to bear more fruit. The reason why some of us are living from hand to mouth is because it doesn't make any difference anyway if you give you much more than that because it all hangs in your pocket. How committed are you to the things you know, the things you believe, and the things you've heard? Why do we need to be committed anyway as I begin to pull it together? Why do we need to be committed? It shows your relationship with God, just like I've said. But let's, let's go a little bit selfish on this. Why do I need to be committed? After all, the other person out there who doesn't believe in Christ, who doesn't believe in Jesus, who doesn't believe anything, he doesn't care about whether there's heaven or hell, they also get prosper. They ride beacons, they build houses, they do all sorts of things. Right? That's the truth of the matter. Saying that is not the case is actually living in self-deception. But as the case, they get everything that anybody could get. But they can only get as far as man could get by his effort. They can only get as far as man could give. But you know, there are blessings that man cannot get by money, by title, by position, by wealth, by knowledge. Those are the type of blessings that you connect yourself to when you become a very committed and responsible Christian. I'll show you some examples in the Bible. Lazarus, in John chapter 11. When you begin to read from verse 1 to 35, John chapter 11 from verse 1 to 35, the Bible says Lazarus was sick and he died. But I want us to look at one passage there, John chapter 11 and verse 3. John chapter 11 and verse 3. He's, he, Lazarus was sick, he died, and they sent message to Jesus. But I want to look at the first message they sent to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Probably the first, first, first message you see. You know, John chapter 11 verse 3. Amen. 
Yeah. They sent out to him saying, Go ahead. Therefore, the sister sent to him mm -hmm. saying, saying, Lord, Lord behold, behold, him whom you love is no. sick. Is the name of Lazarus there? No, he no, wasn't there. They just said the message. He said, Jesus, the man you love is sick. That was commitment. The man you love is sick. There was no need to put name. Is Thor? Is that brother that comes in quietly on Sunday and after the service he runs away? <laughs> no. The man you love is sick. How's the message they sent to Jesus? It tells a lot about the relationship that exists between Jesus and Lazarus. The man you love is sick. They didn't say any other thing. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't embellish it. They didn't do anything. Just the man you love is sick. When you become relevant to God, that is the position you occupy. And the Bible says days later he died. And when Jesus got there, you know, when Jesus got there, Mary and Martha, both of them said, said it. They said, Master, we know that if you had been here, Lazarus would not die. The, you know, they were so sure about it. He said, we know if you are here. Yeah, you may say they are referring to the fact that Jesus is all-powerful. He can do this, he can do that. But they were so sure because of the level of relationship that exists between Jesus and Lazarus. He said, if you were here, nothing would have happened to Lazarus. Because at that point, they've not seen Jesus raise the dead before. So they thought they've gotten to the limit of what Jesus could do. If you were here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus told them, didn't I tell you before? He that believed in me will yet rise again. So we know on the last day will come back. But Jesus made manifest his power because there was a love relationship that exists between him and Lazarus. I show us another example in the book of Acts chapter 9. Dockers in the scripture, just like every other person that comes to church, she's a woman in the scripture, Acts chapter 9, when you begin to read from verse 36. The Bible says Dockers was sick and she died. Now, I mean, you can't, these are things that you can't get by your position, by your wealth, by your, your knowledge, by your connection. No, no man can give you back life when it is gone. So Dorcas was sick and she died. The Bible said they packaged her, cleaned her up, and they put her, it's finished. I'm sure they probably were planning how they're going to do it. But all of a sudden, they heard that Peter was in the nearby village. And again, let's look at the scripture. Let's look at the message they sent to, to, to Peter. It was not in the plan of Peter. Acts chapter 9 from verse 36. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. And now, uh, there was a certain disciple. Okay. There was, Peter. Yeah. Okay. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds. The woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, yes? Then it happened in those days that she became sick and died. Okay. When they had washed her, mm -hmm. they laid her in an upper room. Okay. And since Lydia was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter and Rosa went with them. Thank you very much, sir. Praise the Lord. Is it, look, whether it's in your schedule or not, you must come. You must come now. Why? Dockers was full of good works. Committed Christian. So, in other words, they said, look, Peter, you must, anything, I, I told somebody, I said, whether Peter carried the anointing or not, when he got there and he saw the crime, they said, look, this woman cannot die. Look at the money she gave to me. <laughs> look at the clothes. She's, Eva is the one taking care of us. This woman cannot, whatever you need to do. So even though Peter was not carried the anointing, that concern arose the anointing in Peter. That is what happened to a man that is committed. And so the Bible says immediately, it's okay, everybody calm down, calm down, go out. And then he prayed and he brought Dabita back to life. She literally bought herself out of debt by her commitment and good works. You don't get that by being a multitude Christian, being in the midst of multitude. No. She bought back her life from the power of death by her commitment to God. They recommended her. They said, look, Peter, you must come now. You must come now. And you must attend to this woman. Are you in the multitude? The multitude don't get that. Maybe the 70, but definitely the 12, and of course the 3. I'll show us another example of the scripture. Very interesting example. Luke chapter 7. We need to look at Luke chapter 7, verse 1. The Bible talked about a centurion 
that, you know, had a servant. The servant was sick, very sick. And then the centurion went to meet the elders of the church. Please, oh, help me talk to Jesus Christ. My, my servant is... is it? Now, there are two levels of commitment you see here. Why would the centurion be so concerned about the servant if the servant wasn't a committed one? The servant was very committed. So, I'm, I'm sure he must have taken the servant to the hospital. He must have done so many things. He wanted this servant to be. Why? Because the servant was so valuable to him. That was one level. And the second level, the elders say, ah, your servant, you need help. And the Bible says immediately... If you begin to read further, they went to Jesus and said, you must attend to this man. They recommended the man to be blessed by God. Why? Look at what the excuse they gave. Luke chapter 7, verse 3. Somebody is there already. Just help me quickly read it. Luke chapter 7. He Jesus, okay. He said unto him, yes. the elders of the Jews, mm -hmm. beseeching him that he will come and heal his servant. Yes, verse 4, sir. And when they came to Jesus, they came to Jesus. They besought him instantly. They besought him instantly. Saying, yes, that he was worthy. He was worthy for whom he should do this. He should do this. God bless you, sir. I say he was worthy. Why was he worthy? Verse five says because he loved our nation. He built us the synagogue. Amen. Amen. So you just look, whatever your reason is, whether it's a Gentile, anything, keep that aside. This man is very valuable to us. Attend to him. That's the blessing you get by being committed to God and the things you believe. Today, I want to encourage you, move away from the multitude, from the crowd. Become an inner cycle Christian. Become a dependable vessel. When the pastor is thinking, who will help? Let your name be on the list. Who are the people I can depend on to move the church forward? Let your name be on the list. Who are those people that I know, if I, uh, if I look back and there's nobody there, I am sure I will see this brother, I will see this sister. He said, you must do something to this man. You cannot be a kingdom hardit. And God will not be committed to you. No. Say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these blessings shall be added unto you. God is not a man that he should lie. If he has said it, he will do it. Let me close this with, with this passage of the scripture. There are so many examples, but I want to stop there. There are so many examples in the Old Testament. The Shunammite woman and all those people that God back their life, God back their children, God back so many things in the scripture. Why? Because of their commitment. But I just want to round up with this passage, Job 36 and verse 11. Job 36. I want to implore every one of us to open to that passage and because we are going to read together. Job 36 and verse 11. Job 36 and verse 11. If you are there, praise the Lord. All right. Can we read together? One to go. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. May the Lord bless his word in Jesus' name. Let's rise up on our feet.